Welcome one and all to the latest edition of the USFL podcast interview series, bringing you players, coaches, and personalities from around the United States Football League. Today, I get to talk to someone that is well on the ground level of one of the biggest announcements the league has had in its recent and short history as the Pan- you, as the Michigan Panthers are returning to Detroit and are going to be playing at Ford Field. This gentleman here from the Detroit News has been breaking a lot of the coverage on, of course, the return and what the USFL might be doing behind the scenes for last year. So it is staff writer Tony Paul from the Detroit News who joins me today. Tony, thank you for taking your time to join me on the show. And, um, you know, hey, Panthers are here, finally are playing now in the city um it's been a for you like i like i said leading in you've uh, been covering this at least kind of what they've been doing behind the scenes for well over here at this point would you like to uh, elaborate on that yeah i mean i do a little bit of everything at the news which uh you know i don't specifically have a beat um i've been a beat writer before but uh, i don't have a specific one at the moment so the joy and the uh, stress level with that kind of goes up in that um, it's fun that I get to do a lot of different stuff, but it's also stressful because everything that's not part of a major beat like Lions, Tigers, Pistons, Wings, Michigan, Michigan State ends up falling in my lap. So the USFL certainly would uh, qualify with that. I started covering them a little bit last year when they made the announcement and they went down to Birmingham. Mm-hmm. Um, we did a little bit of coverage there. There was some interest at first, but then it kind of tailed off a little bit once you know the season started and they played all their games down there didn't really have the connection to to Michigan like they maybe had hoped, but um, Mm -hmm. stayed on it and kind of had a a sneaking suspicion that they'd probably end up in in Michigan when they decided to go into some markets because obviously the history here back in the uh, the 80s, early 80s, the Michigan Panthers played out of the Pontiac Silverdome, uh, which was then the home of the Lions and very popular for uh, a couple seasons. Um, One game, they drew over 60,000 fans for a playoff game. They obviously won the inaugural USFL championship back in the 80s. And there's a lot of people here that have a lot of fond memories. And uh, so I kind of thought that maybe they'd end up in Michigan just because the reason that the USFL has gone this way with using the USFL brand and using a lot of these teams is obviously to tap into that nostalgia. And very few markets have the nostalgia that Michigan has. Even last year when they were playing down in Birmingham, the social media reach for the Michigan Panthers was the largest in the league. Uh, they sold almost as much memorabilia, if not more than other teams in the league, even though they weren't playing here. So I kind of thought if they actually did go into markets, it would be Detroit. So I kind of kept poking around a little bit. Uh, a few months ago, I started thinking about, well, all right, where are some football stadiums that they might play? I started reaching out to everywhere. I started reaching out to, you know, the colleges. Uh, you know, I started reaching out to the Lions. Um, there's a soccer team that plays here out in Hamtramck just outside the city. I asked there. Um, Wayne State in the city, you know, just started asking around, just kind of curious if anybody had reached out in Eastern Michigan had kind of acknowledged that, yeah, we've been talking to them. And so I thought that was interesting. Um, and then so uh, I, I kind of went with that, wrote about Eastern Michigan, maybe hosting some games or some practices. And then my buddy with the Lions said, yeah, we're talking to him as well. And once they started talking to the Lions about Ford Field, that just made way too much sense because you're putting yourself in the heart of downtown Detroit. You're putting yourself at a professional football stadium. Um, You have basically the endorsement of the Lions and Mm -hmm. and, and by proxy the NFL. So um, started just kicking around a little bit and uh, came to fruition and they're, uh, they're coming to Detroit. Right. (laughs) I think a lot of people were saying that, you know, if, I think we're talking, you know, right. You mentioned Reinerson, you know, Steve, and you also talk about Ford field. And I think there were thoughts of if they could land Ford field, you know, that would, that would be a win, but we'd understand if they go to Reinerson. Um, how much more of an impact do you see economically for the city? Now that you're going to have the team right there on brush street, right across from, you know, <laughs> now it is you know Comerica, the new tiger stadium. Yeah. I'm not sure. That's a good question. And we're time's going to tell, um, you know, this is still an experimental league, right? Mm-hmm. Uh, it's, 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 they got through the first season, which is a major victory um, because every other spring league for the last 40 years hasn't gotten through the first season, um, especially in recent years with the XFL and the AAF. Um, the XFL is obviously going to give it another go this year. Mm-hmm. Um, but just the fact that the USFL got through the league, the first year is a good, good thing for them. Um, it shows some stability, at least for one year. Um, but until they get into these markets, Really, until they get into all eight markets, I don't think we're going to know what the valid, the, the validity of this league is going to be moving forward. But this will be a, a, a little bit of a test this year with with the you know the four markets and Detroit's probably the the marquee market for this league. I mean, it's a you know it's obviously an NFL stadium, which is big. It's the heart of a major city, 
um, the biggest city in the state, uh, one of the biggest cities in the country. Um, so that's big. Um, and, uh, you know, there's just a ton of, I mean, this is the, Detroit's the only major sports market they're going to right now. I mean, mm -hmm. as far as professional sports, M Memphis has a professional sports basketball team, obviously, but Detroit's got four professional sports teams right downtown. Now they have technically a fifth and a sixth with the, with the Panthers and the stars, but I don't think we're going to know that until this thing kicks off in April. Um, you know, how many fans are they going to draw? They want, they're optimistically out of the gate, hoping for 15,000. They'll probably get that for the first couple games, uh, whether they get that for the rest of the season, if it goes up, it will be uh, an interesting thing to follow, but I don't think we're going to know what kind of economic impact it's going to have until you see the success. And if people are actually going to go downtown to, to watch these games, I think at first there'll be a curiosity factor. So I think at first mm -hmm. it'll be good. But as far as the economic impact on a whole, they can talk about it. Mike Doug and the mayor was at the press conference saying it's a big deal. And, you know, it's 10 more days a year where sports fans can come downtown. Although we're not sure it's 10 more days. It might be half that or six or seven days, depending mm -hmm. on depending on if they play double headers, which they're, I think they're going to do on the 30th um, and how many weekends they spread it out over Saturday and Sunday. Uh, but until, until we see this thing for at least a half a season and probably a whole season, I don't think we're going to know just what kind of impact it's going to have on the city. Mm -hmm. I, I do think that's, I mean, something at least we always keep an eye on is how much does the city come out and interact? And, you know, I, Daryl Johnston, you know, you know hinted and you, you guys talked to him at the press event. I had, we had folks from the U.S. Bowl newsroom there talking about, you know, they're trying to hit a certain benchmark that 15 K at least if they can get that. He's put that on Twitter as well, that he said they want to hit that too. Um, and I think, you know, the interest is there, like you're talking merch wise as well. I think something also why they like Detroit and I'd love to speak on this, just you being, being there as well. I have friends that I have friends and family that are from, you know, from Novi. Um, and so they talk about the comeback. So Birmingham, they did the similar deal talking about its comeback, you know, highlighting a city that maybe has needed a new media light. <laughs> um, where is Detroit in, in terms of just a city today, in terms of that comeback trail? I think it's an over talked about narrative right now okay. um, because Detroit realistically Detroit's been downtown Detroit's been back for a while. I mean, well before COVID the downtown area is vibrant. Um, it's cool. Uh, a lot of people hang out downtown Detroit on the weekends, obviously COVID, you know, cut that off for a while, but people are coming back downtown. Um, you know, I mean, I, I go to, you know, I go downtown a lot of times on Red Wings nights or Pistons, even Pistons nights. And I mean, there's just a lot of people downtown mm -hmm. and, and it's been that way for a while. I, I think that the Detroit comeback is a great national story. Um, I don't think it's as much of a local story as uh, as maybe they're trying to sell it. I, I get why they are, because, you know, everyone loves a comeback story. But I mean, the city's been out of bankruptcy for over a decade. Um, you know, they're getting, you know, they're getting some big sporting events back. They're getting the final four in 2027. They're getting the NFL draft next year. Um, they're getting, you know, eight USGA events, including two US opens, two US women's opens. I mean, the sporting events are coming back. Um, I think that the Detroit comeback story, I guess maybe is still being written, but I think it's, it's pretty well back. The downtown's pretty vibrant. So, but I get why they're doing that, um, you know, talking about it, because everyone loves, you know, at least outside of the city loves to talk about that narrative. But I, I don't think it's as big a deal as as maybe they talk about nationally. That's fair. Fair enough. Um, look, and I look, I I do want to reference. I bring it up because, again, they they talk about the media market. So I understand. Um, I have, like I said, my aunt and uncle, they live in Novi. So they hear about it just as much. Just mm -hmm. thought I'd reference that as well while we're at it, you know, because it's. I think it's you talk about advertising as well, and they talk about the economic impact, and that was kind of brought in. I think with that overall package when they were kind of at that press event. Mm -hmm. um, was there anything else? Because it seemed like that that event over at Ford Field very well well packed out. It looked like for a crowd, tons of media personnel from the city. Um, was there anything there that kind of stuck out to you in terms of just being at that press, or maybe something you weren't expecting that? You know, you've been covering the league a little bit now, but you kind of <laughs> learned or kind of raised an eyebrow at while you're there. Well, I think one of the biggest things, and I've talked about this before, was that, um, you know, when you go to a press, when you get invited to a press conference and, you know, for an event like this, you're not really sure what to expect because it's a new thing. 
it's not a major sporting event. It's, I mean, it's basically <clears throat> call it what it is. It's minor league football, right? I mean, mm -hmm. I think that's fair. Uh, I mean, you know, when you look at it, they don't want to be a, a feeder league. At least they didn't want to be known as that last year. But the reality is, you know, they sent 13 players to 53 man rosters. They sent over 50 players to training camp. They sent over 200 players to workouts and they even had uh, a guy who was all pro who was the USFL MVP last year. So it has been like a feeder league, which to me may, makes it minor league football, which is fine. Uh, everyone loves football. I mean, at, at, you know, at just about every level. Um, so that's okay. Um, but you don't know what to expect from something like that. That's basically minor league football, the minor league organization, but it was really well done. We're really professional, um, really glitzy and, and kind of a, a statement, you know, that, you know, it was, it was a well done press conference and there was a lot of people there. And uh, uh, I think I was a little taken aback by how many people there, there, not just media, but, you know, movers and shakers from out the city. Obviously, they had the speakers. They had went, Mike Doug and the mayor. They had mm -hmm. other people in town or at the press. They had Warren Evans, who's a county executive. They had Arn Tellum, who uh, is Pistons vice chairman. A lot of people remember Arn Tellum is a superpower agent out in L.A. Before he came to the Pistons, he's become kind of an ambassador for the city of Detroit. And he was there and just a lot of people, just a lot of people I wasn't expecting to be there were there. It was a, it was a really good turnout. So they had the support of the city of 100%. And uh, so that's good. Uh, you know, they're going to need it to promote this thing. Um, so it was a good start. I mean, I was, I was definitely impressed. It was, it was professional and, and uh, it definitely caught a lot of people's attention. And that's what you're going to need to do, you know, catch the attention and sell some tickets and um, you know, if they go with the similar model that they had in Birmingham, where they did 10 to $20 tickets and three kids under 15 got in free on each ticket on each, with each, each ticket at adult, mm -hmm. they're going to do okay. I mean, I, I think that every, especially, you know, there's so many, there's so much competition for entertainment dollars today, which is why I don't like totally comparing it to 1980s when they drew 60,000 fans for a playoff game, Right. I don't mm -hmm. think they're going to do that because we have so many more options to spend our time these days. You know, back in the eighties, you didn't have very many options. You know, you didn't have a, a million TV channels, a million, you didn't have the internet. You didn't have cell phones. You didn't have all this stuff. You didn't have entertainment at the touch of a finger, you know, at the tip of your fingertips constantly. So there's a lot more competition for that, but there's always families that are looking for good value, good, you know, to take their kids out to do something you know, obviously we know the economic reality of the country right now and that things are more expensive than they used to be. And it, a dollar doesn't go nearly as far as it did even a year or two ago. So if you could take your, you know, if you could take your kids who kids are the perfect target audience for minor league sports. I mean, if you go to minor mm -hmm. league baseball, I mean, it's kids, all about the kids. So from that perspective, um, you know, if they provide a, a quality value where you can, you know, say buy two adult tickets for $30 total and bring four kids, you know, there's a family of four that can go to a game for 30 bucks. You know, how much is parking going to be? How much are concessions? That's a big question. And I don't know the answer to that. That's going to go a long way in determining how good of a value this is. Um, because as the USFL people have told me that they have control of the tickets and getting people through the doors. But I don't think they're running the parking. I know they're not running the concessions. So is Ford Field and going to back off the NFL prices when it comes to concessions, that's going to go a long way in determining the value. But if you can provide a good value for a family, you've seen it around this area that we have, um, there's a minor league baseball league out in Utica, about 25 miles Northeast of Detroit. Okay. Um, it started like five or six years ago. It's called the US PBL. And this guy basically decided I'm going to create my own minor league independent league and have four teams started with three. Uh, but and all of us in the media were like that's not gonna work i mean you know the tigers are there you know that's just you know they're right down the road no one's gonna go to that it's been a wild success right because it's cheap entertainment for families i mean they sell out they play 80 some dates a year they sell out more than half of them um, wow. it's a beautiful ballpark out there they, they have four teams in the league they all play there and it's basically similar to the usfl in that it's a lot of kids that didn't get drafted or a lot of guys trying to make their one last shot and that league has sent players to major league organizations, more than three dozen. They sent a player to the major leagues, um, a really successful relief pitcher with the Minnesota Twins. Um, so that's kind of the model. And from that perspective, you know, we all laughed at that at first, but because it's such a good value, it's really been a huge success. If that was a success, I think that this could be as well. So long as whoever's running the Ford field concession prices and parking <laughs> prices can kind of back off the NFL prices 
and really truly embrace the family affordability. That's going to be the key in putting people in those seats. Well, I can certainly tell you, I'm I'm fast. I'm fascinated and glad you brought up the attendance por- portion in terms of the concessions. Week one in Birmingham, I think the league learned a lot because uh, Birmingham, in terms of protective state, and they actually were understaffed for that opening game. So I am uh, I'm curious to see how they approach it. I I hope that they they take these notes, they use it for Detroit, and say, all right, let's over prepare, and then we can readjust them because week one they under or at least protective state him under prepared. And I'll tell you, that was a, that was a fun time. Good time there, but it was a little hectic, you know, being like, oh, it's a free-for-all for seats, really. <laughs> it's what happened. Yeah, I would imagine, given the, the resources at the Ford Field, Ford Field's disposal, they'll probably over-prepare as far as staffing. But, again, it's going to be very important what they charge for a beer and a hot dog yes. and a soda. And if they're going to try to – if they're going to try to charge – now, Ford Field for Lions games also – as better has been more family friendly than say the Tigers. I mean, they're, they're, they haven't been like the Atlanta Falcons who have had that great, you know, family affordability thing when they open their stadium mm-hmm. hasn't been quite like that, but it's been lower than, than probably average. Um, but they're going to have to embrace the fact that they're not going to be able to, if they want more people in the stands, they're not going to be able to charge nine, $10 for a beer and you know, $6 or so. To, if they, if they can bring the prices down, and they, you know, people love football. And also, the, you know, the, this league has the advantage of the fact that the Wings won't be playing, the right. Pistons won't be playing, the Tigers will be playing, but they're not very good. Um, I'm sure, I haven't seen the schedule yet. We're waiting on that, but I'm sure that they'll probably balance out the Tigers and the USFL schedule um, and try not to do too much competing. Although that first weekend there will be, and the Tigers are playing right across the street. That's true. On the April 30th. Um, but I think there's a lot of, uh, you know, if they can if they can make this an affordable thing, there's a lot of things going right for it. Mm-hmm. Well, uh, Tony, I am looking forward to the season here. I guess, I mean, like I said, I'm, I've told people myself I'm going up to that opening game. Uh, should be thrilled to go up there. And but I'm a Bears fan. I've gone to Ford Field one or two times, uh, you know, win or loss. It's a solid venue. And you get it indoors in the right. spring. So, yeah, that's a big deal. Win. That's a big deal. And, and that was a big deal also for the league because – they can utilize Ford Field for later in the season uh, yes. when it's a gazillion degrees down in, in Birmingham and, and and Memphis and really hot down there. Uh, they can come up, which is why the Panthers are starting on the road for the first two weeks, because they want to utilize the South as much as possible in the first couple of weeks, the outdoor stadiums, and then utilize Ford Field as much as they can later in the season with the with the Dome. Uh, but it's going to be interesting to see how this works. I, I think yeah. that there's there's some excitement for sure. I mean, we we see the numbers as far as people who are reading about this league. There was some excitement last year, at least curiosity. I think another thing that's going to be important too is the draft, February 20, whatever. It's coming up in you know, mm-hmm. a few weeks. Um, the old USFL had a territorial draft, basically, in that they had a rule that, you know, for certain for a certain amount of players would have to be taken from local regions because that draws interest. Right. right. That's how you got like Anthony Carter on. The that's Panthers how they, that's how the Panthers got Anthony Carter, who was from U of M. And that was a huge, huge deal as far as drawing interest. Already talked to Daryl Johnson and I asked, are you going to put something like that in place? And it doesn't sound like they're going to have anything official. But when they draft, they're going to be paying attention to guys from Michigan, Michigan State, Central Michigan, Eastern Michigan, Western Michigan, even Ohio State. Um, they're going to be paying attention to that to try to get as many of those guys on this roster because that just adds to it. You got this league that it's not the NFL, but if you can bring in guys that people have heard of from their colleges who they followed names like that, um, that'll help as well. I think they're going to definitely prioritize that uh, this year. And, uh, you know, in in little ways they did that last year. I mean, that's why Mm -hmm. the Panthers drafted Shea Patterson number one overall coming out of U of M. Uh, It created some interest at least early on with, with Panth with Detroit and Michigan. And so by proxy, the Panthers, Again, that tailed off because eventually it became just like, all right, well, the team's not very good. They don't play here. They're not really here. So it fell off, understandably. But if they draw, if they draft some local players that people have heard of this year, that'll help. Um, you know, mm-hmm. it'd be interesting. I wouldn't be surprised if they get at least 10,000 fans a game. Wouldn't surprise me at all. All right. Well, Tony, thank you for your time. I know you got to head out here. I appreciate appreciate you really. And um, hey, who knows? Maybe I run into to you up there. I uh, can't wait to get up up to, to Detroit. You know, get to check out some games in person this time. 
for home stadium atmosphere and all the like. Um, and keep keep doing what you do with the coverage, man. We appreciate it out there in the uh, alt football community. It's uh, really really means a lot. Yeah, of course, appreciate you having me on. I look forward to meeting you up in Detroit.